Exactly on time. Yeah. Okay. It's five o'clock. So it's five o'clock. This is the DNSOP working group. Welcome. This is session one. We have a second session on Friday morning. Right. Okay. So my name is Benno Alfreinder. Suzanne sitting beside me. Tim is following our other chair, Tim Isinski, is following the, the DNSOP working group remote. Hi, Tim. Um, area director, Warren, is here in the room. And it's over there. <laughs> Hiding. No, it's over there. Warren, stand up and say something. No. So, um, meeting notes are uh, by Paul. Thank you, Paul Hoffman. That's it. So, of course, this is an ITF meeting, so the note well applies here, and we assume you're all familiar with the note well. Okay. This is important. Now we're uh, well using Meet Echo as also as the blue sheets. So I really, really want to ask everyone in the in the room, and we are a full room, to use the on-site Meet Echo tool because then you sign the blue sheets and they are counted. All your names or well, the attendance is being counted and used for the reservation of rooms in the next ITF uh, meeting. So sign in. If you go to the microphone, raise your hand on the on-site meet call, and then you walk over to the microphone. We really are strict. So if you didn't raise your hand on the on-site tool, you don't get microphone time. Um, remote participants, uh, well, they're already registered if they use the tool, of course, and preferably use headset. Okay, good. This is also part of the note well, but we really, really like to stress this again. There's a code of gu guideline, conduct of the guidelines, RFC, or the BCP 54, and we take it very seriously. So if you feel you're not treated friendly or correctly, drop us an email and we'll, uh, we'll contact you. That said, we go to the agenda for today. So the uh, agenda. So we start with the hackathon updates, 10 minutes by Peter. Uh, oh, then we go to the working group business and for consideration time permitting a draft. So this is the working group business. So the verification techniques presentation by Schumann, the generalized notify by Peter Thomason or Johan, I'm not sure, one of them. They're both in the room. I see someone pointing to Johan. And for consideration, Mark, uh, if time permitting, uh, he will give a presentation of his draft. Good. Um, right, yeah, let me go here. So, yeah, before going here, I want to make sure that we made a lot, uh, we last minute, we made a small change to the agenda for today. So the existing work update, current working group documents update, we will do that Friday morning. So now it's only what we finished in the past uh, three months. Good. So Blue Not Optional is published in end of September, RFC 9471. And just yesterday, SVCB HTTP has been published as RFC 9460. So we're very happy with that, that it's, uh, it's finalized. Um, other things, uh, this is actually not finished yet, but we think this, the QD count is one draft is almost finished or as good as finished, but we really want to have more eyes uh, reading the documents and more feedback on the mailing list, uh, before we go for a working group ask call. So please, please review the document. This is also a request by Ray, the author, Ray Bellis. I think we're done okay. and we can start with, I'd like to invite Petter um, to, to give the, yeah, the hackathon results. So you have a clicker here if you want. Yeah, I do. Exactly, and I will upload, share the slides. Maybe I should first ask, are there any comments on the agenda before we go on, but I didn't hear anything and I think yeah, we do have more time on Friday, so. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Petr Špaček. I see, but speaking for a group of people from the hackathon. Uh, we, this time we had like 20 people working on different things. Some people implemented REST info <laughs> for bind. So finally, we have that. There is work in progress on notify to the parent to say that, okay, now update the DS key. So that was the actual implementation work. And larger group of people, which consisted of DNS providers, large and small, TLD operators, large and small as well, and people who actually implement the code and people who are around since forever in DNS discussed, well, what can we improve in the DNS? And we started possibly unreasonably with a question, if you could change anything, anything at all, what would you change? And of course, we had like six pages full of bullet points from the top to the bottom and didn't know what to do with it. Uh, then we decided, okay, let's be reasonable. And we at the table limited ourselves to, let's say, compatible changes in a sense that uh, we want to keep the namespace coherent, so we don't want to create new DNS which is disconnected, but uh, connected to the existing system. It doesn't, we didn't want to change the management schema, so the zones and the principle that you delegate to someone was like sacred, we didn't touch it. And of course the stops and how it behaves generally for anyone outside this community shouldn't change. So the principle, okay, you send in a query name and type and get something back also was off limits. But other than that, we wanted to see, okay, so how we can actually improve it and be interoperable. But the trouble is that we are definitely the, the first group to ask that question because over the years, there was many, many, many attempts which failed for various reasons. And this time we were hoping that, okay, this group is kind of more diverse than before. We had kind of buy-in from large operators, small operators, various people, implementers. And also the environment is changing because the pressure on the existing protocol is increasing as the environment and the requirements are changing, right? For example, if accidentally some post quantum thing happened for real, we might have issues with the var format. If it doesn't fit in the message size, there is nothing we can do about it in the existing protocol. So that was the starting point. So what can we do, how we can evolve and be backwards compatible? <clears throat> Eventually, from the list of six pages of things which are problem, we've identified, we think, an underlying problem that the delegation, in a sense, the NS record as we know it, is the limiting factor because it doesn't have any structure in it. It's just a name. You cannot change it because everyone is relying on it. At, at the same time, it's not signed, so it's not really a good place to put anything in it. Uh, so, of course, if NS is not cutting it and we can't find any other place, let's try something new. And at this point, I have to stress, this is three days old. <laughs> this is not fully fleshed idea. It doesn't have zero, zero version. This is work in progress from the hackathon. So you get it basically warm from the oven. Here is just the principle. It's not fully fleshed out spec, but this is a principle. We have the NS record as we used since beginning of the DNS. We have DS record that's not changing either. But at the same point where the DNS and DS are creating zone cut in the traditional DNS, we have now the work in progress name DELEC record, which creates a delegation the same way. The difference is that it lumps together all the data needed for the delegation. So we have the name of the name server, IP addresses if it's you know in Bailwick you get the IP addresses the same way as you would get glue. And what's most important, you have array of parameters which are key value. It doesn't have limited length or at least in reasonable sizes. So we can add stuff as we need, which is major difference from the NS, which is not extensible, it's just a name. This mechanism is extensible. Everything is in one place. It's authoritative on the parent side as the same way as the DS record is, and it can be signed. So it's secure, it's extensible, and it's basically a vehicle to enabling new things. It doesn't do much by itself, but it allows you to do stuff. 
And here we have out of bailiwick example, which is way more interesting because it's not just lumping together glue and an S and signing it, but there is more. The Delac record is heavily inspired by SVCB. So it has two modes. And on the previous slide, we have seen the direct mode or service mode in SVCB parallels. So we have the, all the parameters in line. Here, uh, the Delac record is using alias mode, which means that it says, okay, for this delegation, go to different place in the DNS tree and in that different place in the target of the indirection, you will find the connection parameters, which means that we can redirect, for example, to a subtree for a given provider and the provider can manage himself the parameters. It doesn't need to go to register and tweak every little thing. Uh, deviation from SVCB draft is, or RFC now, yeah, is that the uh, alias accepts uh, and we expect uh, to use multiple aliases at the same point of delegation. So here we have two hosters. One is called hoster and the other one has named another hoster. Sorry, I lack of imagination on my side. And the thing is that now the first hoster has its own subtree where uh, the hoster can manage equivalent of NS records on par connection parameters. And the other hoster has the parameters elsewhere they don't, don't need to coordinate. You know, for example, Cloudflare can change records in its place, the other hoster in some other place, Arco Zero or whoever. And of course, at the end of the indirection, you get parameters. So you can, again, key value pairs, you can specify whatever you need for your given server or protocol. So it can be transport like the OT or the traditional DNS, or it can be really wild and say, okay, let's make a clear cut on the wire. We are going to wire version two, and it's like completely different stuff, but still delegated to the same namespace, still connected to the original thing. And of course you can transit to the old system again using NS and DS. Uh, this is basically a summary of what I said, zone cut, it's signed, that's the most important part, it's extensible. And as you have seen on the slide, it creates, the interaction allows us to kind of put in the role of DNS operator, which doesn't formally exist in the traditional RRR model. But here we don't touch the register side of things that's exactly as it was, but we are allowing the operators to modify their own parameters. So. This interaction by itself creates a value, but of mm -hmm. course the extensibility with the key value, uh, key value pairs is the most useful thing because that allows us to do a change once, I mean, bite the bullet and pay the cost for introducing new parent side record once, and then we have extensible delegation mechanism and we can use the optional parameters to do interesting things in future. Again, this is enabling new work. It easily enables new transport and so on, but sky is the limit. We can go further. We are not limiting what can be done with the additional parameters. That's up to this group to use. I think two minutes. I'm aware. Okay. Uh, rest of the slides is for people who will be reading this offline. So I will skip them <laughs> uh, because that's basically what I said it in many words. Uh, and of course it needs work. This is the cornerstone, but now the trouble is how do we get there? This is three days old, very much work in progress. Everything is in flux uh, because we want to have, uh, give the chance to people who cannot be, cannot be here in person. We went to the DNS work Mattermost server. It's real time chat. Anyone can register, links are in the slide. If you register, there is a channel named uh, in the like dash design. And also on the slides, you find the link to the GitHub, where is the current version of the draft. It has like proto version in the making. So it has some text where you can actually look at it and say, okay, this is stupid, or this is good idea. You forget about this comma at the end and so on. Uh, so it's on the GitHub, uh, but I strongly suggest you to jump to the DNS work server as well. So you can see the discussion happening in real time. There's some people in the US looking at it right now, or maybe after the session ends. Uh, and second thing is that 
this needs eventually involvement from registries and registrars because it's a parent site thing. So please talk to your people you know in register registrar business and get their opinion because this will impact them slightly. I mean, it's not a big change, but we need buy-in from their side as well. Thank you. Well, impressive. Right on the stop sign. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> So um, I guess there's a lot of discussion maybe following up. So please reach out. Yeah, we don't have time for now right now, but follow up with Peter and, uh, and, and the others. And it's maybe this opportunity to meet during the week uh, for further on discussions. And thank you. Thank you again, Peter. Yeah, it sounds like a terrific side meeting. All right, next is Shumon. Yeah. Um, if you want the clicker? Sure. There you go. Okay. Uh, hello, folks. I'm uh, Shuman, and I'm going to give an update on the domain control validation draft. So, usually, Shivan is the one who comes up here and talks about this draft, but he's remote today, so you're stuck with me. Um, why is this not advancing? Okay. Yeah. So we pushed out. No, it's fine. I, I, I'm not allowed to change focus on my laptop. Okay. So All just right. checking, uh, <laughs> checking the agenda is not possible for me. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay. So we pushed out uh, Dash 03 in uh, mid October. And somewhat to our surprise, uh, we announced it on the mailing list. There were no comments. So usually there's a barrage of comments every time we push out a new version. So I'm That's hoping there'll be discussion uh, during this week or at this meeting. Um, so let me uh, summarize the changes. So with the permission of the chairs, we've added Eric Nigren as a co-author. I don't know if Eric is in the room, is he? Oh, here you are. Okay, good. Uh, and you may recall that a few months ago, uh, Eric did a very detailed and very clueful review of our document. And we spent some time responding to his feedback and figuring out what, uh, what things we needed to update in the document as a result. And at some point we decided, why are we doing all this work? Why don't we just recruit Eric into our club and make him do all the work, right? <laughs> and so that's what happened, right? So um, the other, let's see, some of the changes, we've tightened up the requirements for token generation. Um, mainly, I think, talking about what encoding alphabets are suitable under what conditions depending on the validation method you're using. We have a more detailed treatment of delegated domain control validation, which is becoming increasingly common in the real world. There is a new section on domain boundaries and public suffixes. Uh, I don't know if it's a new section, but at least new, much more detailed text. And also we have uh, enhanced the validation record format to support some new capabilities, so, such as account-specific validation if you have multiple accounts being authorized to act on behalf of the same domain name, or if you have multiple CDNs or multiple providers. And we also have a mechanism to indicate the scope of validation. All right, so in, uh, on the token generation topic, I think we were a little bit loosey-goosey in the past. We described you could, you know, you can use whatever, base 64, base 32, base 16. So we decided to be a little bit more precise with the language because there are some circumstances where you can't use some specific alphabet. Uh, for example, uh, if you use C names, uh, the um, challenge token is going to be present in the label in the target of the C name, right? Which may have restrictions because you may be using an implementation which is imposing LDH rules or allowing only characters that are allowed in the host names. And moreover, it could be the case that the C name target actually is a host name because it owns address records, right? So you have to be careful about these things. So we've described those limitations. And we've slipped in some other, you know, DNS protocol minutia stuff, which I think most of the people in this room know, but application providers may not necessarily know who are using, uh, uh, you know, these kind of domain uh, ownership validation mechanisms, such as the fact that DNS labels are limited to 63 octets, right? So, so if you're 
uh, using a mechanism that generates a challenge token and a bunch of other parameters, you have to make sure you say well and well within that limit. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's that's all for this slide. And <coughs> are you doing something, Benno? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Typing in Zulip, but uh, that should work. Still focused. Try it again. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep my hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We can spot it up next time. Yeah. Okay. So on delegated domain control validation, I think we've just, yeah. this was already in the draft, but we uh, made the text more complete. I think that's what we did. Uh, I think the, the way it appeared in earlier versions was just an, as an example in the appendix. Now it it's a real version with a fully fleshed out example with the rationale. So the typical way people do delegated domain control validation is you have a C name pointing to a name in, in a zone operated by the, uh, the party you're delegating to. And uh, that owns a text record where they can stick in the application provided secret challenge, right? So that way, uh, it's not only easier for them to uh, do it, but also to maintain it and automate the rotation of it if they needed to revalidate it for, you know, for example, certificate issuance or for some other application. Um, okay, so I'm not going to read the rest of the text, but uh, please review what we've added and let us know if you have any uh, comments or suggestions. And moving on, um, again, for... Uh, domain boundaries and public suffixes, we did have existing text, but I think the only thing it mentioned in the earlier versions that, is that a recommendation that you should not attempt to do domain verification for a public suffix, like nobody would want, want, want to do that for com or co.uk, for example. But it turns out there are cases where you may want to. For example, the public suffix list itself has a division, so there's the ICANN division and there's the, uh, the, the private division, which I actually didn't know because I think uh, I learned uh, about it after talking to, to Eric. And in the private division, there are cases where um, an application provider may want to validate the public suffix itself. And the canonical example you can cite are things like uh, cloud providers doing blob storage or S3, blah, blah, blah they have a whole bunch of customer specific domains under it and they want to uh, authenticate the suffix in order to be able to issue a wildcard certificate for all of them. Of course, that's not the only way you could do it. You could manage certificates individually for all of them, but because this is a use case that people want to utilize, we have a carved out, you know, so may do this under certain conditions um, with additional safety checks. So I don't know, we didn't elaborate on what those safety checks are Ideally, there should be a programmatic way to do that. I don't know, it could be some attribute stuck in the PSL. I don't know if any such thing exists or if the debound or debound two work ever takes off, that's something probably we should make sure that we have a way to express in that protocol. Um, I think that's it, moving on. And uh, the last thing we did was we enhanced the format of the validation record. And this is in order to do a bunch of things. The first is to be able to indicate the scope of validation. So for example, is it for just the single domain name being specified? Is it for the entire domain, by which I mean the domain tree rooted at that domain, domain name? Or is it for wildcard names, wildcards at the domain? And uh, also to be able to support multiple distinct accounts or multiple distinct providers where each of those need to be authorized individually to provide a service on behalf of that domain name. Okay, so I'll go through those, elaborate on those examples uh, specifically. So for the first one, indicating scope, uh, the proposal is that the uh, challenge record, the owner of the challenge record should have some string indicating whether it's for the host or the domain of the wildcard. So that's what we've done. Uh, I think we've shopped this idea around at least with um, the ACME folks. And I think uh, Eric may want to correct me. And I think their initial response was, well, we're not really sure. Maybe we can solve this problem in other ways. 
with CAA records, for example, which do have a mechanism. So I think there's an attribute called issue wild, which you can use to specify whether you're allowed to or not allowed to issue wildcards. But that is, that's incomplete. That's not, not enough to distinguish these three cases. And moreover, that's very specific to a single application certificate issuance, whether the scope of this document is much larger. It's many different applications. So we think there is the uh, need for a general purpose way to specify this. So that's what we've tried to do with this enhanced format. So I think this needs a little bit more dialogue with ACME and maybe other application communities to see if they're receptive to that approach. Um, and on the multiple accounts, so this is, um, if you don't understand what this is, uh, this is, for example, if I, uh, um, uh, I'm operating a service uh, at a provider and I have multiple accounts that I will control, but each of them have to be individually authorized to be able to issue certificates or do something on behalf of the domain name. So all of those things have to be individually, have to have an individual challenge. So the way we're proposing to do that is we just add an account or CDN specific or provider specific identifier token as the leftmost label in the owner of the validation record. So here's identifier token dot underscore foo challenge exact dot com text blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this one, uh, again, we have talked to other folks. So at the last ITF, um, we uh, became aware that ACME is also working on this exact pro uh, problem. So they have a draft, adopted draft in progress on uh, DN ACME DNS account challenge. The way they were doing it is by just sticking the account identifier as a blob after the ACME challenge in the same label. And we proposed, I mean, a better way DNS people would do it is follow the DNS delegation model. So you may want to delegate all the accounts that I own to the same party. You can't do that if you have a blob that identifies the account in the same label. So we have proposed instead to do the thing in a separate label at the front. And um, they thought about it and they came back and said, yeah, we think this is a reasonable idea. Um, so they have a pull request with this change to their document, but it's unmerged. And the reason is apparently the current cab form rules don't allow them to do that. So this requires doing a little bit of work with CAB forum and doing a new ballot. But we've had some discussions with folks there and they think it's, it will be possible to do that. So we'll see where that goes. And I think with that, uh, yeah, that's, that's it, right? That's yep. Okay, so I will stop here for uh, comments or questions. Yeah, folks should notice that the way cool Miraco folks have given us timers now as part of the display. So we have three minutes and 15 seconds for any comments ah, or questions. Okay. okay, thank you, Susan. I just noticed that. <laughs> I was staring at the screen the whole time and I didn't notice it. Yeah. Uh, this is Daniel Con gilmore uh, Thanks for doing this. I think this is interesting and I'm glad that you're coordinating with ACME. Uh, and I see this change here, which is good. Um, uh, in your previous slide, there was some stuff where the attacker, well, not, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm already thinking in attack mode here. <laughs> You've got these labels that have spliced bits in them. Yep. Um, and some of them have spliced bits that are suffixes and others have spliced bits that are prefixes. Yep. Uh, with a fixed string. And I think with this change here that resolves it, but uh, I just wanted to point out that when you have a spec, uh, mechanism where somebody else gives you a half of the label for the suffix, and then you have a fixed prefix for it, and yeah. then another situation where you have somebody else gives you a, their own choice of label and you have a fixed suffix, it's possible to swap those things. Um, and so somebody can sort of force you to generate a label that does the opposite thing. Am I making sense here? Yeah, I think so. I'll have to think through that example uh, a little bit more. It's just uh, yeah. the idea that you're going to split, you're going to build a label yeah. that is spliced yeah. from somebody else's recommendation, recommended text. Yeah. If you once you start doing that splicing, and it, it matters where you're splicing, they need to all either okay. be spliced in as a prefix or all spliced in as a suffix. Yep. And then you need to have a clear registry of what the fixed bits are. 
um, so that you can differentiate between the situations. Otherwise, you end up in a in a in a um, where you can confuse you can yeah. confuse which things are happening. Okay, so this example on the last slide avoids that problem, right? Because yeah, here here you're not, you're not splicing at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, got it. So uh, maybe we should talk about that for the uh, the example where we're using the scope indication inside the same thing, right? Okay, yeah. thank you. Go ahead. Uh, John Levine, um, I like this. This is looks a lot better than the last time I looked at it, possibly because um, it, it, it incorporates a, a bunch of suggestions that I made, and, and some of the authors said, "No, those are stupid ideas." Yeah. So, but beyond that, I guess I guess one and a half th one and a half things to say. One is I don't see we have a registry for underscore tags, and I think it would be a very good idea to encourage people to register these things just so they yeah. don't collide. I mean, it's like it would be a really stupid idea to use like underscore demark as a challenge tag, but right. People like I'm going to be registering my DMARC something or other. Yeah. So anyway, it's a lightweight registry. It's very easy to add stuff to it. And yeah. the other thing is, um, I listened to your discussion about the PSL, and I think your take on it is right. But having spent quite a lot of time talking with Jothan about it, I mean, the PSL will never contain any any flags or tags or anything like that. Because okay. It's like it's, I mean, because they can't keep up with what it with, with what it does now. You know, and you need to keep in mind that the PSL is fu fundamental goal is to is to avoid cookie stealing and anything mm -hmm. else that happens to match there is sort of an accident so yeah. i think you can sort of give people general advice like it would be a good idea to use the, the psl to avoid um putting challenges in places that don't make sense but 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 i think you need to be very clear that it's just a heuristic and you need to make sure that it's actually doing what you need to do because if you do it mechanically you will run into surprises mm -hmm. okay yeah thank you john so in your first comment i think we have discussed that in the early days of this ref of having a registry of underscore application names i think the registry exists you don't have to create it um oh it does yeah okay yeah, all you, all you have to do is tell people, add, and it's really lightweight. It's FC, FCFS. Just tell people to add, add their to add their tags to it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, okay, I'll talk to Paul. He wants to yeah. say something. All right. Um, on the second one about PSL not ever evolving to have other attributes or something. Yeah, I guess I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, I guess that means we'd have to wait for you know an iteration of debound to address those yeah, kind of I mean, kind of meet me in the bar later and i'll tell you the whole miserable story okay um, sorry, sorry we, we yeah we sorry. did close the queue you I was, I was the he, can eric say something he's one of the codes yeah i understand yeah, but uh, yeah one brief remark one sentence is fine but we're really short in time and i don't want to We're just clarifying the psl feature we're not asking for new psl features we're just using existing ones Okay, thank you. That's yeah. good to know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we. we yeah, maybe I'm a bit strict here, but we want to give everyone uh, the alloc allocated time uh, to be fair. So, thank you, Schumann. Thank you, Schumann. Uh, and for, for procedural, the working well, the document is fairly finished, but we are not going for working group last call because we were waiting for the discussions with uh, the cap. Yeah, I yeah. think. It'd be good to wait for some of those discussions. Excellent. So the, the working group knows. Yeah. Thanks, you. Yeah, thank you. Up next is uh, Johan. So you have to make this. Yeah, never mind. So I'm, I'm Johan Stelsam from the Swedish Registry, and this is the latest iteration of uh, the draft that Peter Thomason and I started on generalized notifications, and then John Levine has helped out at the tail end. And now we're sort of down to, to the details, because there isn't much left to say about the general idea. And there you go. So. We have the draft about generalized notifications. I don't get the timer. Oh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Yes. So I have <laughs> infinite time. Um, you want to have the full 20 or shall I go for no, the 18 no, already? No, 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 whatever you think I deserve. Um, so so we, we, have, we have this draft. Um, oh, we have, he's generous. Uh, we have this draft about generalized notifications that we've talked about a number of times. 
And then we also have another draft uh, that I wrote about essentially extending the localization mechanism from generalized notifications for another mechanism of updating the parent. And that is based on DNS dynamic updates instead of sending notifications. And I will speak about that on Friday. So now we have more than one mechanism, so to speak, but they both share exactly the same underlying need for a mechanism to locate where to send the message. The message may be a notify or the message may be an update or the message could be something else, but they need to figure out where to send that. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, obviously, there is always the possibility of a static configuration. That is needed in some cases, that's preferred in some cases, and we will obviously have that. But because of the scale of the issue, when there are millions of delegations, etc., uh, we also need some sort of a dynamic alternative. So there are essentially two questions to determine. The first question is, what are our types should we query for? And either we define a new RR type, never mind what we call it, there are two examples here, desync and notify, or we use an existing RR type like SECB. And the second issue is what queue name should we look for? And essentially what we are defining here is some sort of, of a social contract, an, an agreement between the child, what should the child look up, and the parent, what does the parent publish? In essence, it really doesn't matter what we decide on. The thing is that it's a contract where both parties should agree on what, the, what they're using. So if we start with the RR type, the two alternatives, new RR type or existing RR type, there are certain pros and cons for each. Uh, obviously with a new RR type, we can define whatever we want. We also have the advantage that it will not collide with other uses in the same RR set, which at least I see as, as a major benefit. On the other hand, um, debug issues initially, et cetera. Uh, we, we have SVCB and we could use that. It's clearly sufficient to, to deal with our use case. And you can see that my slide is more than a couple of hours late because SVCB is no longer an internet draft. It's now an RFC. So that con argument actually falls now. So anyways, this is essentially just a decision to make. I don't care strongly which we choose, but we should choose one of them. And then we get to the slightly more difficult issue or slightly more sensitive issue, and that's the Q name to look for. Um, the simplest case, which we've used in the draft, for instance, is to just query for the apex of the parent, the parent name, and then whatever our type we decide on be it desync or, or SVCB or, or whatever. And there is a scheme parameter in there that we've had for a start just to cater to multiple mechanisms and the one means notify. So if that is published by the parent, that means that the parent is ready to accept generalized notifications on that target and that port. However, this is not sufficiently flexible to, for instance, deal with a situation where there are registrars and the notification or update or whatever mm -hmm. should really be sent elsewhere than to the parent itself. So it's very simple to understand, it's very simple to implement, but it's probably not sufficiently flexible. Yeah. Yes. Administrator, could you pull the microphone up? Because one of the remote yeah. folks is saying that you're, it's too short. Nobody's saying you're too tall. <laughs> Perhaps my, my hands are too weak. <laughs> Oh, now. Thank you very much. No problem. And I will start singing. Um, <laughs> so, so anyways, uh, because of this lack of flexibility with the, the simplest alternative, here is another one. If we query for the name of the child, some magic tag dot parent, we could have different expansions depending on the child, which would essentially turn into different expansions depending on the registrar. And well, this clearly works. It, it has the drawback of being potentially a rather large number of records 
in some zone, not necessarily the parent zone, but somewhere. On the other hand, uh, these records could be genera generated on the fly, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we have them statically somewhere. On the other hand, uh, if we look at, let's call them smaller parents, as in parents with a dozen or a hundred delegations, non-registry parents, we want this to work for everyone, then this is overly complex. So it would be nice with something that wasn't, well, essentially forcing people to have wildcards in their zones, etc. Do something more simple. So let's look for some sort of compromise here. And the compromise that we've come up with, I mean, it, it's not a trivial problem how to identify which registrar to send uh, an arbitrary child notification for, etc. So it, it's a somewhat hard problem. But anyways, if we do this, the, the second alternative, and in case we do not get a response, we say, okay, no one at home. And then we fall back to the first alternative and just query the apex. That would cater for the really small zones that just publish one record in the apex of the zone and they're done. And it would cater for large zones with lots of delegations, etc. need that need flexibility to point at different registrars, et cetera. And the cost is essentially that in some cases, this will trigger two DNS queries rather than just one. On the other hand, uh, my view is that we should really optimize for simplicity in the parent end here because the parent is the one that should publish this and the parent is the one that needs to get it right. The child will not query very often. You don't roll your keys every day. You don't change your NSR set every day. It's a low frequency operation. So two DNS queries is not really a, an issue here. And that's where we are. Uh, th this is now a working group document. So it's something that we should somehow try to come to, to a decision on, new record type or use SVCB. And what name to query for or what names to query for uh, to make it both sufficiently simple and sufficiently oh. flexible for the use cases that we have. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric? I'm oh, sorry. Eric Nigren, Akamai. If you want to be able to put it at the zone apex or the zone cut, then you probably do want a different rec record type because this, having SVCB there um, probably is not a good idea because it's, it's ambiguous as to what it is. If you only would ever be using it with an underscore prefix label node, then you could probably use SVCB. I, I completely agree. Patrick Pacek, I see. Uh, I would like to make you wonder whether we will eventually might need some extra parameters or not because the problem with delegation is that we just don't have place where to stack extra parameters. Yeah. Uh, so if you are going for a new RR type, I suggest you make it somehow extensible. Maybe in the future you will want to say, talk to me over TLS or whatever, I don't know. Just think about it, that's what I'm I, saying. I, I see where you're going. And my guess would be that in the fullness of time, we will do some delegate thing. So. In essence, this is to solve the problem we have today. When that happens in the future, perhaps we will need something, or rather use something fancier and more flexible for the start. Okay. But I, I, I absolutely agree. I'm just saying you guys are only already working on more, more general solutions to the, to the problem. John. Hi, John Levine. Um, I completely agree that you need a new RR type for the practical reason that if this is useful, um, Top level domains are going to want to put it in their zone files, and and the people the secure the people at ICANN who approve that stuff would freak out at the thought of putting an SVCB that might do something weird. So that if it's a single single purpose thing that has no other no other purpose, that makes the security issues and the approval much much simpler. Um, I'm a little dubious about putting in um, directions for update because for update to be useful, the, the two sides need a shared secret, and if they can share the secret, they are, they already have a path to to, to tell each other. What address to look at? So I don't, you know, I don't think putting in the update thing hurts anything, but I also don't see that it's useful. Did you say that they are sharing a secret? 
Yeah, you need to, a useful update. Needs to have a needs to have a TSIG on it. Uh, I have no idea, uh, no plans to suggest TSIG in any way, shape, or form. This is six zero. This is only asymmetric. Nothing else. Yeah. Well, then they need some way to tell to, to share like where do you look for the public key? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's yeah. the topic for Friday. Yeah. So I, I agree yeah. with you, but there is no shared secret anywhere in any of the okay. proposals. But anyway, but, but if I can back off a little bit, there's. They need they need some kind of shared they need some kind of configuration information before beyond where to send it. So I'm oh, wondering. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, anyway, if we're going to talk about it on Friday, we'll talk about it then. Jim Reed, Johan, I really like this idea, and I think we're now getting to the stage of just trying to talk through one of the potential implementation details of how we can make this progress. Um, but just something that came to me as, as you were discussing that, what about the situation where we've got deeply nested trees and there's empty non-terminals in the labels? How will the client or the end device find out where the, parent, the delegation point is? Where is the parent? And do you plan this case of iteratively going up the labels until you hit something? Or are you going to find some other mechanism to deal with that? I had some ideas about doing this before and got badly shot down many, many years ago about relying on the, the NX domain response and the SOAR query coming back to see what the zone cut was. So how do you plan to deal with this? I, I, I agree with your, your problem statement that you need to figure out who the parent is. And there are algorithms for that. Uh, and I agree that there are always issues when you tell essentially an authoritative non-recursive name server that it should go out and query for stuff because it tends to get more complicated than in, you initially hope. But we already have other things that do that. So the, the, the problem I agree with, and we're already dealing with the problem in other contexts, but it's certainly a problem. Okay, thanks, John. Hi. <clears throat> Ben Schwartz, Meta. Uh, so on extensibility, I just want to say uh, I I don't think that we need this draft to to talk about DNS transport. Uh, my understanding is that this draft uses DNS, and however DNS is transported, this this should just inherit that. Um, so let's try to let's see if we can can make the text nice and clear about that. Uh, I'd like to understand a little bit more about how this relates to the existing ecosystem of dynamic DNS, which you've hinted at in some of the examples. So there are protocols out there for dynamic DNS and uh, you know, registrants using dynamic DNS to, to tell their registrars to change things. Um, you know, why can't we use that mechanism or how does this connect to that mechanism? Um. There is a presentation by me on Friday on exactly how that works. Uh, I would have preferred to have that before this presentation, but I, I cannot affect that. So okay. uh, you, you, you just have to wait till Friday and then we can hash that out. Um, so so ju just to reiterate, the, the notify draft and the dynamic update draft, they are really, really similar in the sense that they are trying to essentially solve the same kind of problem, how to synchronize the child and the parent. They are really, really similar in the sense that they are both using push mechanisms. And they are really, really similar in that they are using exactly the same algorithm, if you like, that we need to decide on for how to find where to send whatever kind of message it is sending. So they are so similar, but the dynamic update stuff I will present on Friday. Peter. Yes, hi, it's Peter from DESEC. <clears throat> um, so as for Jim's um, comment, I think you only need um, maximum two, two queries to figure out the parent. So you can go one level up. And if you find that's not the parent, we are talking um, about DNSSEC related updates. So the response will be signed. And then the RRSEC that you get when you look one label up, you will see who signed the RRSEC and that's the parent. Yeah. Um, so you don't need to loop until you no, find no. it. Um, and the main uh, observation I wanted to make is a different one, though. Um, so um, in the proposal two, where the um, notification target is um, published under some kind of magic name, 
where there is something in between the child label and the parent label, the underscore desync here, for example. I wanted to point out that that's a general mechanism for the parent to publish um, information about their children. Um, so for example, here, this could be um, the endpoint for uh, where to receive notifications for DS updates, for example, or some other kinds of updates. But the parent could also publish other things there if interested. Uh, for example, if in the future some mechanism would be needed to somehow point at the name of the registrar or something like that, it's conceivable to do that under the same kind of label and then perhaps with a different record type or something. And uh, I don't think we need this now. I just wanted to um, observe that. I think there, th th there might be more use cases to this kind of thing. And I also wanted to observe that um, while this is the parent publishing stuff about the child, there is a similar mechanism that is used, um, for example, for the DNSSEC bootstrapping protocol, which is currently also a working group draft, where um, the child label is um, prepended to underscore something else and then dot the name server host name. And that allows the name server operator to publish some information about the zones they're hosting pretty much in the same way as the parent does it here about the children. So um, maybe it's, it's, it's useful for future developments to keep in mind that these things facilitate the parent publishing stuff about the child and also the, the names of operator publishing stuff about the things they host that are not in the child's own themselves. And it's useful to have these general um, announcement mechanisms and they can both be signed. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, Ray. Yeah, Ray Bellis, I see with my expert reviewer hat on. Uh, yeah, absolutely, go for a new RR type. Uh, I would say if um, SDCB actually has the exact correct uh, semantics that you need, uh, I would suggest you just basically derive from that. So you can reference SDCB and stick with its wire format and presentation format. This essentially makes allocation of the RR type much more straightforward. Because we and just... that would make Peter happy. So yeah, that, that may be a good idea. Yeah. But yeah, basically exact same format, just different number name. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No more questions, and I have 40 seconds that I give back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Okay. So we come to the <clears throat> sorry, we come to the last presentation for today. Um, Mark, there we go. I'm sorry, new timer. Yeah, I set a new timer at nine minutes. I'm not that tall. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Um, context of this draft, um, mostly isolated networks, and it came from the, the, the space community. There's a space uh, working group that is looking for uh, how to deploy IP in space, uh, essentially surface uh, networks, sur uh, celestial uh, surface networks. Uh, there's a couple of references there. Um, space is long delays and in internet intermittent communications, low bandwidth. And uh, space community is asking, including someone you may know, Vin Cerf, uh, for a document on how we do this, um, given the uh, restrictive uh, communications we have. Um, Therefore, DNS resolution back to Earth uh, to internet is not possible. Um, so we need some kind of autonomous environment. But at the same time, uh, there's communications possible to those infrastructures. So there's a way to push, you know, data, zone files, or you know, whatever. We want it to be secure. DNSSEC, the same trust anchor. I'm not sure we want to have another route. And we want to do remote management. In the next slides, uh, local means the remote one. Um, so we need on that play on the surface of Moon or Mars, NS resolvers, uh, trust anchor preloaded. You know, this is all what you everybody here know. Uh, using RFC 8806 is kind of a base here. Um, we need local names, uh, but uh, at the same time, we want to be able by uh, mostly management will be done for some time from Earth to be remotely managed and, you know, add names and things like that from Earth. 
So one approach uh, suggested by Warren, uh, pre-walk all the needed no names. So you, you do a tree walk uh, with the NSEC uh, related RRs, you save it, send it to the local infrastructure. So, you know, the remote one by some means. And, uh, but that requires uh, that you need to know all required names uh, and do not, do not forget one. Uh, second approach, um, you prefetch all the zones that you need in the name, name hierarchy you need. So maybe you'd be uh, looking to choose the right hierarchy, some right TLD in second level, maybe the dedicated. I don't want to enter in the discussion of a special TLD for that. Um, you have access to those zones and you send those zones, you know, by some means. File transfer, rsync, uh, bundle, protocol, you know, name it. Uh, the problem, if it's not a dedicated name hierarchy, let's say that you chose the .com zone, <laughs> there's a lot of non-useful RRs uh, that you would be uploading. And if you remember my last, the first slide, bandwidth is somewhat limited in space, but that's improving. Third approach um, was uh, suggested by Mark Andrews. And whenever I say suggested by someone, Everything, all the errors are mine, not theirs. Uh, you do a special zone or a, a new zone from a current zone that you control. You actually create a new zone with only the needed RRs. You sign it, send it to the remote location. Uh, we could have a new route. We could have split, split DNS local names, but that's the, the point of having local names, names that will be you know, in the normal DNS tree, but use in both places. So that's in a nutshell what it is. I didn't want to take too much time of uh, your time. Uh, looking for comments, review, and if there's an, any interest in the working group. The draft is actually right now not complete. There's a lot more discussions to be done on T TTL considerations and stuff like that. And. Uh, yeah, you're, you're last on the agenda at the moment, and we do have a few minutes for comments, questions. Do people think this is good work for DNSOP to be doing? Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> ben, I guess who's first? Yeah, so Ben, remote. Hi. Uh, so my, my core question about this is, is somebody doing this today? Are there... Like doing what? Robots on the moon that are making DNS queries? Um, DNS queries on the moon? No. <laughs> um, for your information, there's a LT uh, antenna that is uh, going to be launched in two months to moon with a couple of uh, rover, rovers, all IP network, back all to. So it's especially for moon, we're moving fast. Okay, so that's an IP network, but is there DNS in that network? Not, no, because it's an experimental, uh, it's kind of a technology demonstration, as, you, uh, as we say. But, okay. Uh, that, but that thing is actually something that could, you could see other use, like undersea networks or, you know, remote networks that have kind of an intermittent, uh, you know, connectivity and stuff. That there's other, you know, use cases. Yeah. So, okay. Overall, my, my view is like, space is, is fun, but... As far as I can tell, this is not a thing that anybody is doing today. Uh, so it seems a little odd to produce a document providing practice recommendations for a thing that is not happening. Uh, but there are networks out there that are intermittently connected. And I think, you know, we can certainly mention space as an example, but I know that, you know, that, and the draft does talk about isolated networks. I would love to see this drawn from real operational experience of people who operate isolated networks and that has been you know over the decades there have been thousands millions of intermittently connected networks how did they deal with these cool. kinds of name resolution issues and what are the best practices that emerged you know, let's let's oh, go I, I, I would love to get that um but, for your information in space the missions are usually planned like five you know years in advance so you what you have in specs now needs to is something for that would be deployed in years. So, you know, it's actually urgent. 
I also think that we should consider whether the right answer is like, don't do DNS in space. Uh, that like, it's, it's DNS is bound to the planet Earth and like do something else if you're far away from the planet Earth. <laughs> uh, well, there would be an IP network there. So. Uh, for for timekeeping, uh, I'd like to go to the next. So sorry, yeah, sorry, uh, Ben, to, to to cut this off, but uh, I'd Definitely like to. We had to close the queue after yeah. Ralph and then Wes. But, but thank you for your contribution, Ben. Uh, Ralph, you're welcome. I haven't made up my mind if we should do an essence space yet, but uh, one of the questions I have the. I mean, in the end, usually you use the DNS lookup to connect to somewhere. Where are these connections terminated? Uh, mostly local on the surface, because, you know, and then from Earth to re for remote management to the. the so surface. the lookups on the isolated network would be only isolated. Roughly, yeah. So, I mean, that. For That's me, it. cries local infrastructure, and then yeah. the, from Earth, I mean, you find the name somehow. Yeah. Uh, Wes Herdiker, wearing only my University of Southern California hat. <clears throat> um, uh, so my local root project, which is like 8806, but actually offers more zones than just the root, um, which 8806 really talks about, um, actually does this type of stuff. And I looked into transferring very large TLDs um, some of which were doable over standard DNS AXFR, and some of which you definitely need our sync or some of the other things that you talked about. Um, I also had a master's student actually study his own traffic for a week. Um, and in order to do pre-caching and actually sort of learn in advance the types of things that you might use, and obviously it doesn't work for generic browsing day to day, um, but, but his analysis showed that you don't need to pre-cache that much. Um, it's actually a very small percentage that you could get into. So doing traffic profiling ahead of time could get you a long way as well. Mm -hmm. it, <laughs> it should be on my local root site. And, I, and when he was mentioning this, I realized I never actually added the link. So I will try and have that up on the local root site. By the, so it's localroot.isi.edu. And I'll try and have it there by the end of the week because there's no reason it shouldn't be. Thank you all. Uh, Mark has to run, but if you have any questions, please find him later this week or send uh, comments to the mailing list. Uh, before I close, I would want, well, make one thing. Yeah, okay, maybe Friday, but there's a case for uh, uh, QD count is two, and uh, <laughs> we have a working group draft, but okay. One short, it's, it's for DNS SD Elias. It is, it is for thread wireless low speed networking. Yeah. We'll be talking about it in DNS SD on Thursday. If there's time on Friday, I'll bring it. We currently have software written by enthusiastic engineers that's using QD count equal two, and we want to stop that. Yeah, exactly. So go to DNS SD or find uh, uh, Stuart during this week and talk with him. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank all the presenters to keep stay perfectly in time and i'd like to thank the participants here in the room also bye bye uh, see you friday